Hey YouTube, Tire Metalhead Weatherman here. Hopefully you guys are doing well. In uh, today's video, we're going back to the Weather Nerd 101 playlist. We are covering hail, one of the more underrated threats when it comes to severe thunderstorms, but still just as dangerous as the others. Of course, there are certain parameters with hail, just like with wind, uh, the damaging straight line winds, microbursts, and tornadoes. Hail, I think, is one of the more interesting ones of the uh, of the uh, hazards out of when it comes to um, severe thunderstorms, mainly because it's frozen precipitation, technically speaking, but you don't have to have the air below freezing at the surface level to get hail. So it's one unique thing. And then on top of that, the type of environment you need for hail, it's actually more complex than what one may realize. So we'll kind of go, we'll kind of skim over that a little bit. And we'll go from there. But first, in order to get into what environment creates hail, we need to know how it forms. So simply put, hail is precipitation formed in uh, thunderstorms when the updraft carries those raindrops into the colder areas of the atmosphere. And uh, how these hailstones grow is actually through two ways. There's a uh, wet growth and there's dried growth. And with wet growth, basically, the hailstone nucleus ends up uh, being lofted high up into the atmosphere. But it's not super cold. It, I mean, it, the temperatures are going to be below freezing, but they're not going to be they're not going to be like say negative twenty degrees Fahrenheit or negative fifty degrees Celsius, whichever one you want to go by. There's no discrimination here. But upon uh, colliding with the super cool drop, the water doesn't immediately freeze around the nucleus of it. It spreads across the hailstone or spreads across the tumbling hailstone, slowly freezes. So sometimes so with that setup, you can actually get a clear layer of ice. With dry growth, that's how you get that really cool hail, those really cool hailstones with multiple layers on it. And sometimes you get the little spiky spots on it too, which is really cool. But you also need to watch out for those because if you get hit with that, that could hurt really bad. But with dry growth, the temperature is well below freezing. It's pretty similar to uh, snow. Uh, the closer the temperature is to the uh, freezing mark, which is about 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 0 degrees Celsius, you tend to get more wet snow. So this pretty much goes in concurrence with that. With dry growth, the temperature is a lot colder. The uh, water droplets freeze really fast, and the air bubbles are, or air molecules are frozen in place. So you can end up getting those layers with those uh, much big, with, and maybe even bigger hail with uh, these stronger updrafts that bring it into the colder, the really cold parts of the atmosphere. Say like if the hail was lofted about thirty to thirty-five thousand feet, for example, that would probably result in some big hail, but it would also probably be spiky. But anyway, these um, hailstones can actually form in both your uh, garden variety thunderstorms and supercells, or at the as the garden variety storms are co actually called multi-cells, cellular thunderstorms. What's unique about this, though, is supercells are a specialist at producing hail because they have something that's called a weak echo region. So this will be towards like the front flank of the storm, per se. And this doesn't have to be a tornado worn storm or a tornadic type of storm. Just a regular supercell is able to do this. So it'll create this because the updraft will be so strong, the rain will actually get pushed back. And this is often how damaging winds get produced, too. We'll get a little bit of an updraft ahead of the storm. It'll be feeding on that warm air. And it's that updraft that lofts those water droplets up, as we were talking about. As we get into the higher levels of the atmosphere, of course, it freezes. And then eventually, just like with rain and any other type of precipitation, once, it gets, once any form of uh, rain or ice gets too heavy, it falls down to earth. But this, but what's special about this weak echo region is this uh, area. This will create like a small little pocket of dry air out ahead of the storm, and this is ultimately what will end up keeping the storm going. So, 
ultimately this cycle will repeat itself and you can get either ridiculously large hail or gorilla hail as the storm prediction centers called it sometimes or you can get what's called or you can get like a uh, an inundation of hail and almost have an accumulation of it on the ground that's very common in areas like Colorado and Wyoming but anyway let's go ahead and actually look at this little diagram here and this is going to actually give you an idea of what kind of updraft we would need in order to get what kind of size of hail so we'll start with the ones that are below severe limits any uh just to clarify by the way any hail that's below severe limit any hail that uh goes to severe limits is about one inch in diameter or two point two point five centimeters but basically for uh, bb size hail you don't you don't need much you probably have encountered bb size hail a bunch of times especially if you live in the southeast we get decent updrafts with our thunderstorms even with the garden variety ones so if you have some heavy rain every once in a while you might get a little bb bb sized hailstone maybe even pea size but usually this only requires an updraft of about 24 miles an hour or so so that's not really it's not really uh impossible for that to happen it's not surprising either the next step up will be marble size, which you would need an updraft about 35, and then dime size 38. And really, you can kind of scoff at this until you get to about quarter size hail. Quarter size hail will start to leave maybe some small dents in your car. Uh, you'll notice a much louder thud when that hail uh, hits the ground. You'll see it bounce off the ground. It becomes a lot more visible. And this would actually make criteria as a severe thunderstorm. You definitely wouldn't want an aircraft flying through this. So to get up to get a uh, quarter size hailstone, you need about a 49 mile per hour updraft, and then things pick up from there. You go to half dollar, you get up to about 54. Then this used to be the old standard for severe thunderstorms, which was golf ball size hail, 1.75 inch hail. You need a 60 mile per hour updraft. You need a, a 60 mile per hour updraft for that. Then you go to hen egg, which is about two inch hail. This is what you would classify as significant hail. So whenever uh, you see me go on to the Storm Prediction Center page and looking at the reports, when you see that little uh, green number, and then there's like a little uh, backslash, and then you see a number next to that, that's significant hail. Anything above two inches is significant hail. But we'll go to hen egg size where it's sitting at 69 per miles per hour. And then after that, this is where things start to get a little bit more dangerous. You get the tennis ball size, two and a half inches. We're starting to leave some pretty big dents in the car here. Possibility increases of maybe a windshield breaking or window breaking even in your house. We're getting really high into the updraft numbers now, about 77 miles per hour. And once we get the baseball size, I'm really hoping that you wouldn't be outside at this point because this will hurt you really bad or worse. But baseball size hail, 2.75 to 3 inch diameter. But that's uh, 81 miles per hour. Then beyond that, it just gets ridiculous. Teacup, 84 miles an hour. Grapefruit, almost 98 mile per hour updraft. And then, of course, the granddaddy of them all. And there's been bigger hail than this. I've actually heard there was once a 9-inch hailstone. Of course, this was out west towards the Rockies. I think it was Wyoming. But to put it in perspective for you, this is a softball size hail, 4.5-inch hail. You need an updraft of 103 miles an hour. So imagine that being doubled. I think you can imagine what the wind speed is on that, uh, or the updraft wind speed was on that uh, particular cell. If we're already looking at 4.5 inch hail and seeing 103 mile per hour updraft, yikes. I don't even want to think about it. That's almost the equivalent of, that is the equivalent of a uh, low end EF5 tornado, which is nuts. But that's pretty much the basics behind how hail forms and what kind of updraft you would need. Now let's actually look at the, the uh, parameters that we would uh, look at to forecast where the probability of hail is high. So there's two particular ones that 
usually I would look at here. Mainly it's this one because I don't I've never seen a model that pulls this up yet. I'm familiar with the K index, but we're mainly going to be talking about delta T, but we will touch up on this as well. So the delta T is my other alarm. <laughs> Sorry about that, you guys. So I'm up early and I got to get ready to go to work in a little bit. But anyway, so uh, the delta T index basically assess the contribution of middle middle level lapse rates to uh, convective instability. The steeper the lapse rate usually will uh, be more favorable for stronger convection, which includes microburst and hail. So whenever I look at a uh, sounding or audiograph, I'm always looking for this. I'm always looking for an increase in uh, in an, uh, dry, yeah, in a dry lapse rate here. Having trouble speaking, that kind of threw me off. Um, but in the warm season, about 26 degrees Celsius is a pretty sufficient lapse rate. Really a moist one, really moist uh, sector would be towards about maybe uh, six to uh, six and a half degrees Celsius per kilometer. And this is towards the mid to upper levels in the atmosphere, by the way. So basically what that will look like is I'm going to go over to Pivotal Weather. And it'll be something like this, for example. Scroll down, wait for this to load. But anything that's a little brighter than this blue color here, which is about 6.5, that shows a sufficient lapse rate. Now, one other thing before I go on to K-Index is I want to make this very clear. Do not worry about this unless your area is forecast for severe thunderstorms. These lapse rates mean nothing if there's no thunderstorm over them. It's just like with the low-level jet. Like there's guys out there on out here in the YouTube scene that are very good at what they do and they talk about how the low-level jet is considered as tornado juice. But they also will tell you that if there's a... Uh, no thunderstorm over there to take advantage of that environment. You have nothing to worry about. So, like I said, and the same pretty much applies with this. Like this area over here that I'm looking at right now, they're not going to get any thunderstorms. They're probably going to get snow, actually, if anything. But over in these regions here, no thunderstorms are really expected. So this is nothing to be concerned with. Maybe here would be more concerning, but there's not even thunderstorms forecasted for my area, so there's nothing to worry about. But just to, I just wanted to clarify that before we went on to the next part of this here. So the K index, not something I refer to as not something I refer to as often when I'm doing any of my uh, forecasting videos here, but simply put, the K index is a measure of thunderstorm potential based on the vertical temperature lapse rate. So it's basically similar to the uh, delta T index, the uh, mid to upper level lapse rate. But this also factors in the extent, the uh, vertical extent of low level moisture. So it's pretty similar to the uh, pretty similar to the lap to the uh, DTI lapse rate, but a little bit more advanced, in my opinion. But I've never seen any uh, forecast models from what I use that actually indicate the K index. And this also factors in the low-level moisture. Oh, I already mentioned that. <laughs> but yeah, you can. But yeah, just to clarify, really quick before I get into this, the uh, low-level moisture. This it's this right here, the 850 millibar. Once you get to the mid-level, 700 millibar, and as you go higher up, it will be 500 millibars. This is all based off of pressure. And when we get towards the surface, it's about 925 to 1,000 millibars. So. Just wanted to clarify that before we got into this. So basically, there's a this is the formula right here, by the way, for any of you uh, math and science nerds that want to get into this. But uh, basically, in degrees Celsius, where the T represents temperature, the TD represents uh, dew point temperature, and the DD uh, represents dew point depression. Depending on uh, how that formula is factored out, and the 
indexes that you get you can end up getting a uh, you can end up getting indexes and if they're below 30 then you don't then you have severe weather and heavy rain possible but once you get to just a little bit over 30 then uh, you have better potentials for thunderstorms with heavy rain once you get to uh, 40 it's pretty high potential for severe thunderstorms heavy rain so that's pretty much the basics on hail here uh, don't think this was I think this is probably gonna be one of my shortest videos on here which would be really nice but anyway I'm gonna have to hurry up and get ready to go to work if you like what I did here definitely drop me a like appreciate that as well if you're enjoying the uh, playlist definitely subscribe because I'm gonna continue on with this even beyond severe weather winter weather will be up next given the fact that I've made this video during the winter time actually so I'm trying to keep things relevant here there's you also just to clear just to clarify during the late fall and winter you still can get severe weather so don't be complacent so if you hear about a tornado warning in your area definitely take it seriously especially if they say it's on the ground but anyway enough trying to act like Smokey the bear this has been tired metalhead weatherman i'll see you guys in the next video you guys have a good one and take care